Civil Aviation Authority. They are the regulator of the aviation industry. So basically what they do, they are there to make sure that everybody basically does what they're supposed to do in the aviation industry, follows all the rules and regulations, and also issues things like pilot licenses, for example. I'm Zandile Ndela, I'm your host for today, and I'm a commercial pilot as well. So the whole point of this show is for us to unpack for you guys the different career options that are available within the aviation sector. So today, we've got our two special guests who are joining us here. Um, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves to us and tell us who they are and tell us a bit about themselves. Okay, hi Zandile, hi everyone. My name is Cynthia Bonyo Butelezi. Um, I'm a commercial pilot and I was born in the East End. I started my aviation journey around May 2013, mm -hmm. where we got through this um, sponsored by the Department of Higher Education and Training, which mm -hmm. was facilitated by Mugani Aviation. So for that um, bursary program, we had to apply and the requirements that they needed was level five for math, science and English. In high school? Yes. Okay. So we applied for that bursary program, we went through the selection process where we did psychometric tests, and then after that we did our medicals, because mm -hmm. it's very important to have a medical as a pilot, class one medical. By the way, what's medical? Please do. So, <laughs> I know, but so a medical, a medical, pretty much it shows that you're medically fit to become a pilot. Mm -hmm. You have to go to an aviation doctor that tests everything: your eyes, your ears, your lungs, and everything. And then, if they find that you're medically fit, they issue you with a class one or a class two for to training to do PPL, CPL, and so on. Mm -hmm. So for your PPL, they can give you a class two, but for your CPL, you definitely need a class one. Mm -hmm. So I started my training, we did our medical, we did the subjects, we had eight subjects that we had to do for our PPL, which is the first license that you obtain. When you register at an ATO, you don't go to a varsity to become a pilot, you go to a special school, an aircraft training organization, or ATO. Mm -hmm. So when you register, you automatically get an SPL, which is a student pilot license. Mm -hmm. So that means you have to fly with an instructor until you get a private pilot license, mm -hmm. then you can fly alone. So throughout that whole process, we started around May 2013, we did the eight subjects that we had to do. I don't know if you want me to list the subjects, but there's eight for your PPL. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we started our flying, because that's how they structured the program. Exams first, flying later. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the program, we had three chances to write each exam. Mm -hmm. If you fail, you rewrite up until that time. After that, they kick you out of the program because of the time constraints and the money and the expenses and everything. Mm -hmm. And the pass mark in the aviation industry in the exams, it's always 75%. Yes. So if you get less than 75%, unfortunately, it's a fail as much as we get a pass when we're in high school, when you get like 30%, 40%, but in aviation, that's not a pass. Yeah, true. So you have yeah. to be very, very focused and get through your subjects. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, I went solo about August 2013. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest moment of my life. So solo is when you're flying alone as a student without an instructor. Mm -hmm. So then after that, um, we continued with the flying about 40 hours or so, I got my PPL. Mm -hmm. So with the breakdown of the hours for your solo, it's about 10 to 20 hours, then mm -hmm. you can go solo. Okay after you've had those hours. And then for your PPL, between 40, 45 hours, you can test for your PPL. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you continue to do your subjects for your comm, and then you get your hours for your comm. Yes. So which is about 200 hours as a minimum. Yes. So from then on, after I finished my comm, we went to 43 years school, mm -hmm. we renewed our comms, mm -hmm. and then we did our instructor's rating. Okay. And then we tried to get jobs as instructors, couldn't. Mm -hmm. So for me, I had to come back to Joburg, then I did my drone license. Mm -hmm. Then I started instructing on drones. Then five months later, I was called by for the prayer school. Then I went to instruct on them as well. Okay. So that's pretty much how is my journey gone down until this moment where now working for the CAA. 
Okay, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank, um, thank you. We have a fine brother here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, looking all good in uniform. Please tell us a bit about yourself and your history and what brought you to this moment. Okay. Hello, hi. Um, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Reba Onema Rupefela. In short, you can call me Reba. And I'm originally from Matikeng, Mahokwe Koi Koi, which is a village in the northwest. Mm -hmm. So we're probably just about 30 minutes away from the border of Botswana. Okay. So that's where I grew up. So mm -hmm. my journey starts from a typical village boy coming with a wheelbarrow, going to get water. Mm -hmm. And every time you look at the sky at full clock, there'll be an aircraft that crosses on top. Mm -hmm. I always hear the sound and wonder, what is that exactly? Mm -hmm. You know, you look at it and you're like, you know what, I'd like to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. So I go to school, research more, and that's eventually how I've got to know about the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, my school had one computer, so mm -hmm. we had to have a scheduled time to actually use the computer. So each and every after school, I'd make sure that I actually go to the computer and actually research about being a pilot. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, um, I grew up, selected my subjects. I already knew that by grade, um, grade 10 that you needed uh, physics, math, and English mm -hmm. in order to be applicable to get a buzzer. Mm -hmm. um, um, within the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. So I selected those subjects, um, matriculated. Um, thereafter, I wish I was as fortunate as uh, Cynthia and the others, <laughs> you know, in terms of getting um, um, sponsorship. Sponsor, yes. But unfortunately, it was not the case with me. Um, being a, my mom being a single parent, uh, she actually took out a loan for me to actually mm -hmm. go to school. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually very fortunate to her for actually allowing me to actually do that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Um, I went to a school called uh, Lutzavia, but it is actually in Pretoria. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I also did my training in 2013. Mm -hmm. After completing my PPL, everything went quiet. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get sponsorship, I couldn't get a job because, hey, I didn't have enough experience or the enough hours in mm. order to be applicable. Yeah. But do remember, I only had something called a private pilot license. Mm -hmm. With that, that license only enables you to fly recreationally or for private use. Mm -hmm. But by law, I cannot earn any remuneration yeah. based on that. So I needed to get a commercial pilot license, of which I did not have funding for. Mm -hmm. So the best thing I could do, keep applying. So yeah. that's what I did. I kept applying, kept applying. Applied to organizations such as, such as the South African Airways, such as Express, such as the South African Civil Aviation Authority, mm -hmm. and indeed they did respond. Mm -hmm. However, they didn't respond in the traditional sense in terms of funding. Mm -hmm. They actually offered uh, internship programs within the organization. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I applied for an internship program, mm -hmm. and that's how I got into the CAA. Once I was within the CAA, they are the ones that funded me towards my training. Mm -hmm. And I then started to actually do majority of my training through the drone side, or what we call outpass. Mm -hmm. So I did my remote pilot license, mm -hmm. and then I did my BV loss rating. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to continue to do my instructor rating. Mm -hmm. However, as we speak, I am continuing with my commercial pilot license. Mm -hmm. And eventually, like she has explained, we'll follow the very same trade that she mm -hmm. did in terms of her training. And that's where I find myself here today, mm -hmm. working as a flight operations inspector within the South African Civil Aviation Authority. Well, well, well done, guys. You've really gone a long way. Um, basically, uh, I love what you said uh, in terms of explaining your journey of how you got to where you are. But I think let's just unpack it a bit more for our learners at home. Mm -hmm. You spoke about a drone. First things first, let's explain to them what a drone is. Mm -hmm. Because they, they can hear us saying drone pilot, drone. they might not even know what that is. So let's, let's paint that picture for them and explain to them maybe what a drone is. So in essence, um, right in front of us, we do have an image of what a drone is mm -hmm. or what an RPAS is. Mm -hmm. So an RPAS, um, it's a collective term of different um, forms of unmanned um, aircrafts that we find within um, the world as at large. Mm -hmm. So we, we come from small model drones where you mm -hmm. find at your retail stores that you buy for kids and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then you get um, similar products like this whereby they're a bit more sophisticated mm -hmm. and they've got um, much more use towards them. Going all the way to big aircrafts, um, which you find like the USA and other countries having um, drones such as the Predator mm -hmm. that can fly from one country to another. Mm -hmm. So in essence, a drone or an RPAS is any other form of aircraft. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that the pilot is not inside the aircraft, but is actually flying it from outside the aircraft using something called a controller. Mm -hmm. So that is in essence what a drone is. So. What's happening now due to technology and the revolution of the fourth industrial revolution yes. coming into place and mm -hmm. so forth, um, 
there's a lot of change that is taking place and with the change there's a lot of opportunities that are coming mm -hmm. into it so traditionally when people think of aviation they only know being a pilot fixed or wing. being a cabin crew yes. yeah helicopters uh, fixed wing and so forth mm. yet there's a big world in terms of aviation so many opportunities that yes. people are not aware of and mm. one of them are drone opportunities that are out there. Yeah. And of course, there are different uses of drones. Mm. Um, they're actually impacting a lot of industries. You mm -hmm. find them in agriculture, you find them in construction, you find them in surveillance. Mm. A lot of industries are actually being disrupted by drones. Yes. And it is actually an true. aviation career. Mm. Yeah. Very true. Um, I love what you just mentioned now, because I, I was starting to feel a bit fearful that these things might take over our jobs. <laughs> so. <laughs> And I wouldn't want that to happen. But anyway, let's come back to you, um, um, Cynthia. Um, you spoke about the different phases you went through through your training, um, your high school, the requirements that were required, the, the different, um, how do I put it, the different licenses that you actually obtained. But I think um, being a commercial pilot myself, we can just unpack it a bit further to them that as much as you have your maths, your science, that's a requirement and your minimum level, which I believe is level five, yeah. that you need to obtain in high school in order to qualify for the different bursaries that are available. For example, I'm a bursary recipient of the South African Civil Aviation Authority. They also funded me to get to where I am today and obtain my license. So now coming back to you and the journey that you've just explained um, with everything that you went through, what I want to know from you is were you aware of the things that you encountered? Like, for example, you spoke about the 75% pass mark. Um, were you aware of such things? And, and I, want, I want to understand, because with me, at first, it was a bit intimidating. So, but once you get there, was it as difficult as you expected? Because I'm a, I'm a regular girl from the township. So it can seem a bit intimidating from a distance. How did okay. you overcome that? So for me, I'd, I, I also felt the same challenges coming from a background where you go to school and township, lack of facilities and things like mm. that. So you get by with whatever means that you have. Mm -hmm. So get, coming into the aviation space and you find out that the pass mark is 75%, mm. it, it was a little bit, oh my God. But knowing myself, I'm always that student who's trying to push to know more, to learn more. So most of the stuff by going into aviation, I didn't have a full picture mm. of what to expect. I had to learn those things quickly while I'm in the training process. Yes. To say, okay, the first step is to get your PPL. Then after that, it's your calm, your night rating, and everything in between that you find as you're doing your training. Mm. So from my side, it was intimidating, mm -hmm. but with the studying and the good instructors that you get, mm. then knowledge ends up becoming like second nature mm -hmm. to such a point that 75% is just, it's not even a concern because you have that knowledge. Mm. It's not about Krampus forget it, but it's about understanding. Yes. Because that is the difference between life and death yes. in aviation. Yes, thank you. I love that. Let's just cross over to you, Reba. Yeah. Um, she was just right now referring to a PPL, CPL. I think, can we just unpack that for the learners at home? Because, for example, um, when she was referring to, first she mentioned an SPL, which is your student pilot's license. And that's the first license you get in order to start your pilot training. But then we, she also spoke about a private pilot's license. Can you then just unpack that in terms of a private pilot's license being a license that you use for recre rec recreational flying yeah. for find the differences between the CP, a PPL and your CPL? Can you just unpack that for them, please? Okay. Um, I think to make it a um, better understanding, I'd like to make an example like your traditional, getting your traditional driver's license. Mm. Uh, you are aware that there's a learner's, and then you get a code 8, a yes. code 10, and a code 14. Mm. So uh, the higher you go with the numbers, the more um, experience or the more training that goes into it, because yes. the bigger the truck is, or yes. so forth and so forth. Yeah, mm. exactly. So similarly with us, so mm. we find different type of licenses. Mm -hmm. um, your student pilot license, I would refer it to something like a learner's. Yes. It enables you to get um, further training and further licenses within the field of aviation. Mm. And then you find something called a private pilot license. Yes. This is what you obtain after your student pilot license. Mm -hmm. But your private pilot license, in essence, it teaches you how to fly an aircraft mm. for your own recreational yes. or private use. Mm. But in order for you to get uh, remunerated for that, mm. there's further training that is in needed in order for you 
to actually be numerated for that. Mm. And we call that a commercial pilot license. Yes. But in order for you to get that, um, there's a certain amount of trainings and ratings that take place between that. Mm. Um, she mentioned something like night rating. This is flying at night. Yes. Then you find something like instrument rating. Mm. This is now flying the aircraft just using your instrument inside. Mm. And so you do that and you also do your uh, conversions into a bigger aircraft. Yes. So you either go into a multi-engine Multi-engine meaning that you've got, and you're flying an aircraft that's got yes. two engines. Mm. And then sometimes you go to a single engine, but mm. uh, it's just a bit more complex. Yes. So, yeah, exactly. So instead of fly, um, driving, uh, jumping up to something bigger like a VW Golf, for mm. example. Let me just make an example like yes. that. Yeah. So once you've got your commercial pilot license, that's now the bare minimum that you need in terms of flying in the industry. So mm. that's what gets you in the door. Mm. However they still require experience after yes. that. So now you still need to do further training mm -hmm. in terms of our building mm -hmm. or whether it is bigger ratings. By rating, what I mean by that is that if we were to use the analogy of a car, mm. in aviation, mm. in order for you to be able to fly a certain aircraft, mm. it's like saying you're only allowed to drive a specific make of a car. Yes. So if you want to drive a Golf, you need to get a rating for a Golf. golf yes. If you want to go drive a Yaris or whatever BMW, you mm. need to get a specific rating for that because yes. uh, the airline will be operating using that particular type of aircraft. Yes. So the last type of um, license is something called an air transport pilot license, mm -hmm. which is now um, which This is the type of license you find usually in airlines. Yes. So these are people who have got an experience of about 1,500 hours oh, and above. Yes. However, there is something called a frozen ATPL, yes. whereby if you don't have the hours but you've written the subjects, you then obtain that license as well. Yes. So those are the four types of licenses in terms of fixed wing and helicopter. Mm -hmm. However, we do also have a license for drones mm -hmm. or RPES. Mm -hmm. We call it a remote pilot license. Mm -hmm. We only have one license for now okay. and different ratings within it. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of licenses that we have as being a pilot in South Africa. Oh. Thank you so much for unpacking that for us. Um, also, guys, just to clarify one, things, one thing for you guys. Cynthia spoke about going solo. Um, what going solo actually means, it means... You actually, the first solo that she was referring to is you flying an aircraft all on your own without an instructor present. So now, now that I've clarified that for you guys, um, the one thing I also want to know is we all, every person's story is different. Um, the challenges we go through and stuff like that. My story is different from yours. So what I want to know is what were your personal challenges in getting to where you are now? Okay, so... My personal challenges, the first one, of course, was the subject. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if you were being sponsored and you're being told, you've got three chances per subject. Mm. If you fail, you're out. Mm. You know, so you have to make sure that you always keep that standard 75% and above. Mm. So once that's gotten easier, the second challenge, when we started flying, we struggled a lot with the fuel. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that the weather is good and everything, but the fuel bay is empty. So mm. you spend time sitting down, not flying. Mm -hmm. So now you end up being rusty. And thinking about it's during those initial times where you're still starting to learn how to fly. Mm. So if you sit for a long period of time not flying, you end up forgetting those three hours of exercises that you've done. Mm. So you have to go back again and restart from the beginning just to rehash some of those ideas to you know, mm -hmm. make it second nature so that you don't have to think about what you have to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the other challenge was, the biggest one for me was getting a job after mm -hmm. getting my calm. Mm -hmm. Because when you get into this industry, people are telling you that as soon as you have your calm, you're mm -hmm. getting a job. Yes. And that is not true. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very steep incline from then. Mm -hmm. I mean, after getting your 200 hours for your calm, mm -hmm. you still need to try and find a way to pay for yourself to get an instructor yes. in order for you to get hours for those hours to get you a better job to get into airlines. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at getting into SAA or those companies. You need at least 1,000 or 1,500 hours mm. and you finish your comm with 200 hours. Mm -hmm. What happens to that difference yes. from 200 to 1,500 hours? Yes. How do you cover that? Mm -hmm. Paying for the ratings for the next bigger aircraft that you want to fly, like a caravan or King A, it's costly. Mm -hmm. And coming from a background where there's no parents working at home who are going to ask. Mm. So those are the challenges that we faced until such a time where I was afforded the opportunity by Pro Wings to mm -hmm. come and train, mm -hmm. do my RPL through them, do my instructors through them. Mm. That's when I actually started getting a job mm -hmm. after doing my fixed wing license and CPL. Mm -hmm. So those were the challenges that I personally experienced.
Okay. Wonderful. And by the way, guys, she just made reference to an instructor's. So what she's basically talking about is an instructor's rating. Um, like she was mentioning that after you get your CPL, you would then go on to do your instructor's rating. What that rating allows you to do is that you are able to train other students um, to become pilots as well. So basically you're doing pilot, you're like a teacher teaching other people how to fly. So that's the instructors she was referring to. And then back to you, Reba. Um, I'd love to know about your challenges as well. Because like we say, each story is different. Yeah. Mm. I think my biggest challenge would have been funding. I mm. think um, funding is not um, easy to come by, mm -hmm. um, especially um, when you don't have access to information. Yes. I think um, knowing where the funding opportunities are mm. are very vital when it comes to this industry because um, that is a very, uh, that's like the backbone mm. of you being able to complete your training um, um, successfully. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about the training, but obviously within it, there are different resources mm. that you need in order to aid you. Uh, in terms of your studies, you know, we find things like Question Bank. Mm -hmm. Question Bank is like a website that helps you prepare for exams mm -hmm. before you actually go write the actual yes. real exams. And that's not standard in terms mm -hmm. of normal training. Mm -hmm. That's an additive that you can have if you have money mm -hmm. to actually purchase access to um, sites like that. Yes. So pe a person like myself, I didn't have the opportunity to actually um, have opportunities and resources for mm -hmm. me to do that. So I think for me, the biggest opportunity was funding. Mm -hmm. However, do you remember, I then completed my, com my private pilot license, mm -hmm. then everything went quiet for me. Mm -hmm. So now also, you're not, I'm not employable mm -hmm. at that point. I can't be True. employed as a pilot, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't have money. Mm -hmm. My mom is a single parent and she can't afford, and she still got debt. Uh, depth uh, behind her back. Mm. So at the end of the day, um, for me, the biggest, biggest challenge was the, 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 the finances. However, also, I think another challenge for me was that I didn't have mentorship. Mm. I had passion, I had mm. drive, I had done my research, mm. but there was no one walking me through telling me what to do and where to go. Yes. And it becomes an isolated world. Mm. You live in your own world, and if you do not have the mental capacity mm. to keep yourself motivated and to keep pushing and to keep trying, mm. that becomes a big um, um, disadvantage on your behalf. Yes. So that was another challenge on my behalf, that I had no mentorship mm -hmm. until I kept pushing and a door opened. That's when I started getting um, um, more uh, mentorship from other people and help from companies such as the South African Civil Aviation Authority. Mm -hmm. But I think one common, and I think each and every pilot will probably experience it, like she had mentioned, is mm. once you've got your commercial pilot license, mm. what happens after that? Mm -hmm. That is the catch-22. That is a very tricky point because mm. we don't mention that a lot. Yes. And it is a very important point that mm. when you go into your training, Mm. already have that in mind to say yes. what are you going to do once you've got your commercial pilot license mm. do not go into it without a plan mm. because you're going to find yourself in a bit of a pit hole mm. and you won't know how to get yourself out of it so True. i think that's one challenge that we, it's going to be common amongst all of us mm -hmm. yeah wonderful um and just one thing guys as much as we are talking about the challenges it's not to put you off um realistically speaking in anything you do you will find some sort of challenges we all went through it. It took me personally 10 years to get my commercial license from the time I started my training. But just like Reba, my biggest challenge was finance. Um, and, and with anything, before you start it, it seems challenging. It seems impossible. But once you're there, I can honestly say, um, Cynthia spoke about exams. For me, exams are not a challenge. Every person is different. Um, but when somebody, before I got there, somebody said to me, 75%, my eyes popped. You're like, you know, how am I supposed to get 75%? Exactly. But it's doable. As much as she's saying it was a challenge for her, you might find that there are certain subjects she found that were doable and not as challenging. <laughs> and, and then there are others where you're like, uh, I don't know this, but that shouldn't put you off. So it's not all doom and gloom. Yeah. Now we're going to go to the good part. Yeah. So what, what is it that sold you on it? It's the flying. <laughs> <laughs> it's the flying, honestly. Yeah. With me, I came with that mentality that, oh, I'm going to be a pilot, I'm going to travel the world, I'm going to mm. see all these places, learn about different cultures, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But once I was there, it just became so much more than that. Mm. Like just that feeling of you being inside that aircraft and taking off and flying, it, it's a different world altogether. Mm. Like you even forget that you're anticipating the travels and whatnot. Mm. Now you're just in the moment. That's what I like about it. You are in the moment because mm -hmm. everything, you have to react here and now. Mm -hmm. So I love 
just the feeling of exhilaration, you know, that freedom that you feel when you lift off the ground. You're like, yes, mm. now you're in this different world altogether. Just, yeah. I love that. Also, the challenges that come with this industry, they grow you as a person. Mm. They make you much stronger. You're able to confront situation. You're able to think on your feet. You are an independent problem solver. Mm. You Reaction time is quicker mm. because that's what they're teaching you throughout training, you know, mm -hmm. to say, if you have an engine failure, this is what you do. If you do this, now everything in life, it becomes automatic. Mm. Everything just becomes second nature. You, aviation is a part of you. Mm. Even when you speak, you can't speak normal English anymore. Mm. Just put in the terms because it's life. Yes. That's what I enjoy about this industry. <laughs> True. You know, based on what you just said, my mom usually laughs when she drives with me. It's usually a case of clear, right? You know, <laughs> clear right, clear ahead, clear left, the standby. So it's quite funny because it becomes part of you. But that's how often you do it. And back to you, Reba, what sold you? Um, honestly, it's similarly. Um, it's the flying. Mm. Um, honestly, um, it's hard to describe until you actually experience it, being mm. behind that actual aircraft, mm -hmm. being in full control of that aircraft. Um, mm. You just get blown into this beautiful world. Mm. Um, that's my heaven, if I can pull it that way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's amazing. Mm. But one thing as well is that um, it's not just the fixed wing part, I'm also a part of the drone um, mm. sector. For me, it's also about the problem solving yes. that what we do as a career brings mm. into society at large, you know. Mm. Um, economically, this is going to be such a big impact in South Africa that I see it solving so many problems. I mean, you look at Rwanda, whereby they were actually delivering medical supplies to mm. villages using drones, drones because yes. they could not get there through uh, using cars, you mm. know. That is innovation at its best, and that's the industry that I'm in. Mm. So one thing that sold me about it is that we're actually solving problems, mm. you know. Being a pilot is not just about glamour as well. Mm. At the end of the day, globalization is based on air travel, you mm. know, moving goods from one place to another, mm. moving skills of different people from one place to another. It's mm. all based on the movement through the air. Yes. So we are a critical part of society and mm. we make society work. Mm. So I was so privileged and so happy to be part of an industry that is so impactful in this mm. world. And that's what told me about aviation. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are bringing back so many memories. So, um, you know, while we are on that, I was just thinking, um, one point that I wanted to clarify to the, to the viewers at home, whoever's watching, that I, I don't know if you've picked it up, but in our industry, being a commercial pilot myself, we, for example, we don't go to university to do your flight training. We go to, either you go to a flying school and we know that there's a lot of fraud out there. So for more information on things like that, this, the regulator, which is responsible for the show, the South African Civil Aviation Authority, you are able to get um, that type of information from them to avoid going to fly-by-nights type of institution. They can provide with that information. They also, like we said, provide your pilot licenses. That's where they issue it. You do your training at the institution, but the institution doesn't issue your pilot license. It's actually the regulator, which is the CAA, that issues your pilot license. So I just wanted to clarify that so that there's no confusion for you guys at home. And as well as the requirements that we also spoke about, um, I just want to emphasize the fact that the, the subjects that we're speaking about, they are recommended subjects, especially if you want to get a bursary. Because in order to be eligible, they'll want that maths, they'll want that science, they'll want that English. But in aviation as itself, like, as, as, as an industry, it's not really a requirement. So if, if your parents maybe have the funds to finance your training, then you're able to go to the institution without these subjects and be able to do a pilot training. There are a number of pilots that have gone into it, become very good at it, without having ever done maths and science. So it is doable. But if you do need that bursary, like I needed it, then it's advisable for you to actually get those subjects done. So any last words as we wrap this up to advise the learner at home in terms of what we can do, how they can approach their respective careers, should they be interested in something like pilot training? Any words of advice, just briefly. Okay, so from my side, what I can say is, number one, research. Don't be shy to ask questions. Like one of my teachers said, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Mm. Even if you ask it 100 times, ask it until you understand. Yes. So do your research. Mm. Number two, you can go to the CAA website and find the list of the schools, the mm. ATOs. Mm. And then you can go to the schools, ask questions. If you can afford, you can even ask for an intro flight. Mm. They'll take you up and fly with you just to see if this is really where you need to be. Mm. But all I'm saying is research. Whether you come to CAA or you go to the schools or you find people on social media, ask. Mm. There will be someone that will guide you and say, do A, B, C to get you to this point. I love that. Reba, 
Any words for them? Wow, she's already touched on everything. <laughs> and <laughs> obviously, for me, backbone is research and so forth. But I also feel that um, there's other things that um, we don't pay full attention to mm. that play a critical part in your training. Mm. Number one, have passion. Mm. Have extreme passion for what you're doing because challenges you will meet. Mm. But the only thing that's going to make you overcome the challenges is having passion. Yes. Number two, I would suggest people to have a different frame, um, mindset rather, of an option. Mm. That's not, it's not something that you get taught at school. Yes. You need to come with that. Mm. So you need to be persistent. You need to have a hunger. You need to have passion to say that, you know what, no matter what is going to come my way, mm. I'm going to overcome. Mm -hmm. So it starts with your thinking. It yes. starts with the research. It mm. starts with you preparing yourself, telling yourself that, you know what, I'm going to do this. Yes. And I think that is the biggest advice I can give to anybody. Mm. Have passion and have hunger for what you want to do. Yes. And I promise you, dreams come true. It's come true for all of us, mm. and we know better than anyone else. Yes. Exactly. I'm just a typical village boy, mm. and here I am flying aircraft and drones. Mm. So it happens. Guys, if you're not inspired, then I don't know what will inspire you. I, for one, um, just on that note as well, I just want to add this little thing that my biggest challenge initially was the fear. She mentioned something, Cynthia mentioned something about an intro flight. Not everyone can afford an intro flight. So it comes back to the research. They... You go to the internet, find out what type of personality, for example, you'd need to, to do well as a pilot. That's what I did. And I just want to emphasize this. You might think flying, fly big, big aircraft. I can't do this. This is scary. I've never even been on a plane. One thing I want to emphasize is that never let fear stop you from doing what you want to do. My dad used to always say to me, fear. You, he used to say, you'll die many times before your actual death because of fear. Exactly. Fear will kill every dream that you'll ever have if you allow it to dominate you. So don't let the fear stop you. Feel the fear, but do it anyway. Thank you so much. We're out.